I want to welcome back Sean Patel, who is the founder and CEO of Prep Expert. He's a Shark Tank entrepreneur making a deal with Mark Cuban back in 2016. And he's also a board certified dermatologist who received a perfect score on his SAT. Sean, welcome back. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back, John. So I just wanted to share with all your listeners real quick that we have an amazing partnership with the College Admissions Process Podcast, and we have a really special offer for all of your listeners. So for any listener who wants to enroll their student into one of our prep expert SAT courses, ACT courses, or one-on-one tutoring programs, you can get 30% off just for being a listener of the College Admissions Process Podcast. All you need to do is put in the promo code College Talk, one word, just College Talk, and that'll give you 30% off all Prep Expert SAT courses, ACT courses, or one on one tutoring packages. Make sure you use the link in the show notes of the College Admissions Process Podcast. Thank you, Sean. We really appreciate it. To our listeners, as an affiliate partner with Prep Expert, I want to be transparent with you that for every purchase made using our coupon code, which is College Talk, the College Admissions Process Podcast will receive a small commission from Prep Expert. But rest assured that we only promote programs that we believe in and feel would benefit our listeners. So whether you're preparing for the SAT, ACT, or need a one on one tutor, Prep Expert has the tools and expertise to help you. For more information, please see the Prep Expert affiliate partnership link in the show notes. And now let's get back to the show. Welcome to the cap, everyone, the college admissions process podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce you today, Brianna Grimes, who is from Vanderbilt University, where she works as an admissions counselor. Brianna, thank you so much for being here today. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. It is our pleasure. So let's get right to it. Why don't you tell us about yourself and what does a typical year look like for a college admissions counselor? Definitely. So um, again, my name is Brianna. I actually was an undergraduate student at Vanderbilt. Um, I graduated in 2020 with a major in gender and sexuality studies, a minor in Italian. And now I've been in the admissions office as a counselor for almost a year coming up this summer. And so I have almost experienced all of the different cycles that we have within a typical admission season. The summer is kind of a bit of a lull. We do some light programming where we have visitors on campus, which we do all year round. Then we start to ramp up in the fall with our recruitment and our big travel season. Of course, it's looked different due to COVID, but hopefully this year we'll be able to get out to all of those cities, lots of different events that we do on the ground so we can meet our students and counselors. Then to the winter, we shift to reading applications, which is a huge undertaking because, of course, we get so many wonderful applications from students all over the world. And as we wrap that up, we also start our on-campus programming, which is what we're doing right now. Lots of admitted students events for those students who were admitted after we wrapped up reading. And of course, lots of these overlap. um, So that's a lot of fun about our cycle. But that's kind of what the typical year looks like. Well, thank you so much for that intro. And I've heard that Vanderbilt University has the perfect balance between outstanding academic offerings, but also social life offerings. So Brianna, what is it about Vanderbilt University that makes it so appealing for so many students to want to apply, but ultimately attend? I would not say that any school is perfect as a former student myself, but I have to say (laughs) Vanderbilt is pretty amazing with that balance. I think that first of all, it's just how well-rounded the resources and the options are for students academically in terms of the liberal arts. We're really big on research. Around 60% of our undergrads will do some sort of research before they graduate. And then, of course, the social offerings as well, which I can talk more about later. But we have so many different organizations and clubs for our students to be involved in. And also lots of students really enjoy that we're a decent sized campus but we're not a massive campus so you have all of the resources of a huge research school with kind of the community feel of a smaller liberal arts school and that community is definitely a big part of what draws a lot of students here we are so collaborative lots of students ask is it competitive more dog eat dog and I have to say it was just really wonderful to have the support of faculty students and staff we're like one big Vanderbilt family here and so I think that that kind of calm energy where everyone just really works together and enjoys being together is something that really draws students here when they visit how many applications do you review a year and do you Brianna 
represent a specific region? As an office, we all work together because most of our applications will see multiple counselors, multiple readers. Um, and so all in all, we read 47,000 the past couple years. We wow. did have a huge spike after COVID. So the past couple years have been our biggest pulls ever. So 47,000 this year. And my territory is all of New York State, um, which is really exciting. I've loved New York as a territory and also some homeschooled students. Brianna, I'm glad that you mentioned students that are homeschooled because I actually received a few emails from parents who have their children that are homeschooled. What advice or what other insight could you offer to those students and their parents? Um, we do get lots of questions about homeschooled students and there's a large amount of homeschooled students that we represent. Um, there's about two of us in our office and we kind of split the load between us. Whereas our territories are typically assigned by the location of your high school, homeschooled students are all kind of grouped together and then assigned to us. And for the most part, the homeschool application process is not too different, um, but of course context is really important and that's something that we incorporate for all of our students, but especially homeschooled students. So we are going to take into account all that information based on your coursework, what classes were offered to you in terms of rigor that we're looking for. We are not going to compare one homeschool student to another homeschool student because everyone's curriculum is different. So with homeschool students, we just definitely take care to look at all the information, ask questions if we have them so that we can accurately evaluate them. But for the most part, we don't look for anything extra or additional from homeschool students that we look for traditionally schooled students. We want to keep the playing field very even for all of our non-traditional students. Understood. And what is the average profile of the current freshman class in terms of their GPA and any other related data you collect, such as SAT or ECT scores? Mm -hmm. I want to preface this by saying we don't have any minimum cutoff. So if you wonder what classes, what GPA, what test scores do I need to be admitted into Vanderbilt, there is no minimum. But I do have the numbers for our first year class. Um, in terms of students who received one or more honors for a leadership position in school, 100 percent. Lots of our students on campus are leaders in one way or another, and that leadership can look so many different types of ways. Um, about 94% of our first year students were in the top 10% of their graduating class. And in terms of test scores, that middle 50% for the SAT is 740 to 780. The middle 50% for the math part of the SAT is 770 to 800. And then something that's really big in the South, the ACT, that middle 50% for the first year class is 34 to 36. So again, these are just the middle 50% for our most recent first year class. These are not hard cutoffs, but that will kind of give you an idea of what those numbers look like for our admitted students. So Brianna, with so many students applying that are worthy of admissions, however, having limited seats available, what does the overall admissions process look like at Vanderbilt University? I have to say it's really difficult, but also really humbling because these students are brilliant. I feel like Vanderbilt was not near at the status that it is 10 years ago. I'm born and raised in Nashville and the growth has been amazing. And so it can be really difficult when we receive thousands more applications than spots that we are able to fill. But my advice that I can give to the students is don't let any numbers, any admit rates, testing numbers kind of discourage you from applying because we look at every single part of the application. We use a holistic review process and that context-based review earlier. So what one student does to be successful might be completely different from another student. We really want to make sure that we have all different types of students from all different backgrounds on our campus and those that showed engagement and leadership in lots of different ways. So it can be really hard um, to describe how we fill those spots, but it's not just one type of student that we admit to Vanderbilt. We look at that whole picture. So all I can ask of the students, because I know it's a difficult process and it's stressful, is to just put your best foot forward. By your senior year, you've already done all the hard work. You've taken most of your classes. You've taken most of your tests. And now is the time to just show us what you've done the past four years. And we just look at all of that information within our pool. And we take a lot of good care to make those decisions. Again, I've heard Vanderbilt University as being described as having the perfect balance in terms of great academics and all of those social opportunities. So, Brianna, what can you tell us about life on campus outside of the classroom? 
There are so many ways for students to get involved in and off of campus. We have 500 plus student organizations that are run by the students. 90 of those organizations are, are cultural or identity based for students, again, from all different types of backgrounds that we have here on campus. Um, Greek life is also definitely a thing here. About 30% of our students are involved in Greek life. And so it's definitely not the massive presence that it is at other schools that might be larger. It's kind of like if you want to be involved in Greek life, there's so many opportunities for you to do so, but you're not going to lose out on the social aspect of campus by not being involved in Greek life because there's so many options. And in terms of off campus, Nashville really just is the perfect place to be for a college student, if I do say so myself. In terms of the music scene, of course, we are Music City USA. Of course, we have those larger venues, the Ryman, the Grand Ole Opry, Bridgestone Arena, but there's lots of smaller venues that college students really love to go to, and I found some of my favorites in the smaller music scene. In terms of sports, we have so many different sports teams here from the Tennessee Titans to the Nashville Predators. We just got a new soccer team. So if that is your jam on campus and <laughs> off campus sports, we have that here in Nashville. And then of course the food, we are definitely a foodie city and Vanderbilt students are in an even better position because we have a program called the Taste of Nashville, which allows students to eat at over 20 restaurants all across Nashville with their campus meal plan. So wow, that's lots awesome. of Definitely. You can keep yourself busy on campus if you would like, but lots of students really branch out and go enjoy the city of Nashville because Vanderbilt is a part of Nashville and vice versa. So whatever capacity you want to be involved in, whatever your interests are on campus, off campus, there is something here for you. That sounds terrific. Do you measure demonstrated interests? And if so, Brianna, what are the types of things you're looking for? Good question. We actually don't track demonstrated interest. The exception for this is our waitlisted students. So for general first year admission, we don't track demonstrated interest. Of course, students are welcome to send updates, send emails. If they have any questions, we definitely want them to reach out. But a student who has attended virtual sessions and emailed their counselor is not going to be at an advantage over a student who hasn't really interacted with Vanderbilt before. Now for our students on the wait list, we do like to see, you know, if you have a letter of continued interest, we welcome that more rec letters, any new information that would help us in that process. But that is only for our waitlisted students. So for our first year applicants, we do not track demonstrated interest. We want all of the students to be involved just for their own benefit and their own information. Well, I think that's great advice, specifically for students that are on the wait list. If in fact they are interested in Vanderbilt University, reaching out, letting their intentions to attend known, I think that's a really good piece of information to put out there. So thank you for that. Brianna, what kinds of application options do students have at Vanderbilt? In other words, early decision, early action, regular admissions, and of course, are there benefits to any of these? Absolutely. So we offer two different types of decision plans, which are early decision and regular decision. And then early decision is split up into two further plans, early decision one and two. Early decision is basically a binding um, decision plan. That means that if you apply to Vanderbilt early decision and you were admitted, you were committed to going to Vanderbilt, you will have to withdraw all your applications from other schools. And this is definitely a decision that is something you really want to consider with your parents, with your counselor, and you want to take a lot of time to think about it before you commit because it is a commitment and that is something that we really like to stick to and we like for our families and students to stick to it as well. The only difference between early decision one and two is the deadline. So let's say you would like a bit more time um, than that November deadline. For early decision one, that deadline is going to be early November. For early decision two, the deadline is going to be early January, probably January 1st. And that is actually the same deadline as our regular decision plan. So you can submit your application by January 1st, regular decision or early decision two by January 1st. And the choice of the decision plan is yours. So just keep in mind, if you submit early decision, you'll have to sign a paper saying, I am aware that this is, commi um, that this is a commitment and this is binding your counselor one of your parents will have to sign it. And this is before you will get your official financial aid package, which is why we have net price calculators on our websites for students who kind of want an estimate of how much it'll cost their family to attend Vanderbilt. So we definitely encourage families to just look at those numbers, kind of make sure that they're comfortable with that um, because you won't be able to compare them with other financial aid packages. So that's kind of one of the I wouldn't say a con, but it's something to consider with early decisions. Something that people would consider a pro is that the early decision admit rate, because the pool is smaller, hovers around six, 17, 16 percent. 
for regular decision, our admit rate is around 4% because um, the pool is so much larger. And I don't say that to discourage students from applying regular decision because that decision, again, is up to the individual and there are pros and cons to both. So I say if Vanderbilt is your first choice school and you can't see yourself anywhere else and your whole family is fine with that commitment, there's no problem with applying to early decision. That pool is extremely competitive because all of those students, Vanderbilt is their first choice. So that's something else to keep in mind. Regular decision is also competitive a lot more students but you don't have that binding commitment so if you want to see where you get into other schools you want to compare those financial aid packages just so you can make sure you're making the right decision for you there's no problem with applying regular decision it's up to you well thank you so much for that explanation I will put the link to the office of undergraduate admissions on the show notes and of course Brianna if there are any other links you want to include please just share with me and we'll put them in the show notes Brianna, I know that Vanderbilt University is, in fact, test optional. Can you share what percentage of your applicants actually choose not to submit test scores? That's a great question. Um, for our previous first year class, 45% of admitted students and um, applicants, so those percentages are actually quite close, 45% of students who applied and were admitted did not submit test scores. So that means the other 55% did. So it's kind of split almost half and half, which I really love to see. And I hope that that encourages students to take advantage of test optional if they decide that's right for them. I get lots of questions. So you say you're test optional, but are you really? We really are test optional and hopefully that number, half of the students that we have on campus our first years applied without testing and they were admitted and they're all on campus doing wonderful. Hey, podcast friends, are you or someone you know in need of some custom college gear? Prep Sportswear carries a wide variety of college fan gear and apparel, including T-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, hats, and so much more. So whether you're getting ready to go to the game, hanging out on campus, organizing a college bed decorating party, or you're simply looking to build upon your college gear, Prep Sportswear has you covered. Check out our Prep Sportswear affiliate partnership link in the show notes for all the details. As an affiliate partner with Prep Sportswear, the podcast does receive a small commission if you make a purchase. But rest assured that we would only promote products that we believe in and feel that would benefit our listeners. And now, back to the show. Well, that's actually very helpful, and that's specifically why I asked the question, because I was getting emails from some students and parents asking just that. So it's interesting to see that 55% of the admitted students did, in fact, yes. send test scores, but 45% did not. So that's a very interesting piece of data to have for the students and parents. Thank you for sharing. I also read about the need-blind admissions process at Vanderbilt University. So what kind of scholarship opportunities do you offer for academic achievement, and does a student have to apply separately for any of these offerings? So we offer three primary merit-based scholarships. Those are called the Ingram Scholarship, the Cornelius Vanderbilt Scholarship, and the Chancellor Scholarship. They're all under the broad umbrella of academic achievement. Some of them look for different, more specific things, and those can all be found on the admissions website that you're already linking um, under scholarships information. Um, but these are very competitive scholarships. They go to maybe the top 1% of our freshman applicants, or so around 200 of those first year students will receive one of these three merit-based scholarships. Um, fortunately, you don't have to submit a separate application for two of them. For the Ingram Scholarship and the Chancellor Scholarship, the application is um, strongly encouraged and preference is given to those who apply, but we are going to consider every applicant for those two scholarships, regardless of if they apply or not. For the Cornelius Vanderbilt Scholarship, a separate application is required. For all three of the scholarships, you will need to submit your application before you can apply for the scholarships. And so definitely keep that in mind because the deadline for our early decision two and regular decision um, plans will be January 1st and the merit-based scholarship will be around December 1st. So if you are interested in those merit-based scholarships and you were applying for that January 1st deadline, make sure to get your application in early before that December 1st deadline if you're interested in scholarships. That can get kind of confusing, but I hope that that makes sense. But yes, we have merit-based scholarships. 
something that we give out a lot more of in terms of financial aid for our students is our need-based financial aid program called Opportunity Vanderbilt. And yes, through that program, um, we are need blind for all US citizens and eligible non-citizens. That means that when we are deciding who to admit and reading applications, we don't take into account how much you can pay. If you can pay towards your tuition, that information is completely irrelevant towards whether or not you'll get into Vanderbilt for US citizens and eligible non-citizens. Well, thank you so much for the explanation. I truly appreciate it. And again, it'll be in the show notes. Brianna, can you share what you look for when reading a student's college essay? Definitely. And I know that the essay can be such an important part of the application for our students, and they really can spend a lot of time on it. And I really have loved getting to read so many of the different essays from all of these different students because they have incredible stories. And really what we want is just to hear your story. We want to hear your unique voice. You have to remember that an application is only so many pages and we are getting to know you as a student and all of the things that you have done up to this point in high school. So we wanna make sure that we see information on the essay that we don't necessarily see on other parts of the application. So we don't just wanna read a summary of your extracurricular achievements if you've already listed those tell us something else that will give us more perspective into who you are for when we are making those decisions. Um, and also, there will be more than one essay. Of course, if you're applying to the Common App, you'll have the Common App essay. You can choose your prompt and that will go to all your schools. You will also have a Vanderbilt specific essay. That prompt is the same every year. It's about an extracurricular activity. So just like with the personal essay, we wanna get some new information that isn't in other parts of the application. We want the same thing for the extracurricular essay. Make those two essays about different things so that you can kind of maximize your real estate and give us all the information that we need to make an informed decision about your admission. Well, thank you so much for that explanation. How do you evaluate varying state assessments? For example, New York State has Regis exams for all of their students in their state. Your school is obviously outside of New York State. So how much weight do you put on these types of assessments? I have to put a disclaimer that I knew nothing about Regents when I first got here because <laughs> I'm from Nashville. Fortunately, our wonderful director, Maura Poe, worked for years in New York and she's really helped us um, evaluate Regents when it comes to reading applications. Um, and I know that for lots of schools, Regents or an advanced Regents diplomas are graduation requirements. So you need to pass your Regents exams in order to get your diploma to graduate. Um, and so, of course, we will expect if that school has Regents, we will expect that the student will have passed their Regents exams. We don't put too much weight on the actual score of the Regents exam as long as the student passed it and we'll be able to see that. In terms of Regents courses, we also look at those, um, but we really look at that on a school by school basis. So say some schools will offer Regents courses with a Regents exam, but they will offer it at an honors level or at an advanced level. That's something that I saw a lot. And so we just go based off the information that is given to us by the school. We will ask the school if we need more information. So if a school waits a Regents class as honors, we will consider it as such. If the Regents class are kind of just regular classes, we will evaluate those as such. We put more weight on a student's GPA or on standardized testing if we received it, then the Regents exam. So for Regents, we kind of just make sure that it's there, make sure the student is in good academic standing and they've passed their exams, but we are not paying too much attention to the actual numbers of the Regents exams because it's, again, it seems to be standardized and all of the schools are doing it. And so it's just something that we look for. We know what it means now, but we are looking more at the other parts of the application, if that makes sense. It does. And you mentioned the GPA. I was just curious, do you use the GPA as indicated on the student's transcript or is there a metric that you use specific to Vanderbilt University? Yes, yeah, so we do both. We look at whatever GPAs are given to us by the school. Of course, some schools don't even offer GPA, and we do have a way of kind of standardizing GPAs as much as we can so that it can be even based on the different grading scales at different schools, because keep in mind, we also have homeschool students, international students, and so we have a way that we can standardize it as best we can, but that's where that context-based evaluation really comes in, because we are going to be using the context of the school district, of the course load, and all of that to make that decision. So it's not just the standardized way that we can do the GPA so that everyone can be evaluated the same, but that context is important as well because every school is different. Well, we appreciate that insight, Brianna. Thank you again. And lastly, what are the three top pieces of advice you would offer prospective students and their parents who are starting the process now? 
these are things that I, of course, wanted to hear when I was going through this process not too long ago, but also just questions that I've gotten from lots of students. First is um, kind of logistical, pay attention to deadlines. They're very important, especially if you're gonna be going to college, deadlines are something that are really important. Now, life happens and we are completely accommodating for all different types of students, counselors, families. When things come up, especially the past couple years, there's been a pandemic. So life happens, we're always gonna do our best to accommodate you when that happens, but definitely pay attention to the deadlines. Make sure that you have a whole calendar of all of your different colleges that you're applying to and when they need different things. Ask your teachers and counselors in advance for recommendation letters. Definitely make sure that you are on top of of those deadlines because if you're applying to several schools which I know lots of students are things can get lost really quick and we don't want to have to get emails from panic students I want to do the best to assuage that panic and so definitely don't panic if you have to miss a deadline because again things come up but stay on top of them as best you can is my first piece of advice my second is to have a lot of options now this goes both ways have reach schools. There's nothing wrong with having your reach school or your dream school. Vanderbilt was my dream school, but I thought it was such a reach that I almost didn't apply because I looked at the admit rate and the testing and I just thought that I wouldn't get in. And my mom was like, you can't do that. You can't let fear rule all your decisions. <laughs> so I applied and I got in and it was just the best experience of my life. And now I'm here working here and getting to help other students do the same thing. So this goes for all of your colleges, not just Vanderbilt. Don't take yourself out of the race before you're even in it. If you see yourself as a good fit somewhere, definitely apply. Have schools at all different ranges, but you also don't want to put all your eggs in one basket for one school. It's great to have a first choice, but make sure that you have backups. Make sure you have other options because you never know what's going to happen. As long as you have all your bases covered, you are going to end up exactly where you're supposed to be and you are going to have a wonderful life past the four years at college and then my last piece of advice that i really really want students to hear especially juniors in advance of this process is that an admissions decision is only an admissions decision it's not a judgment of you or the work you've done we only have, again, so many pages to get to know all the information that you've given us. We don't get to see everything you've done. We don't know who you are as a person. We only have that information. So I definitely don't want students to take any of their decisions personal. I have lots of students ask, well, what did I do wrong? What more could I have done? And the thing is, with the pool this competitive, we have thousands of brilliant students and oftentimes there is nothing more you could have done. So I also don't want students to break their backs and feel like they have to get in a lot of extra activities, do a lot of extra clubs, take a lot of extra classes that aren't really what they want to do because they feel like that's what they need for their resume or for their application. What you have done up to this point is enough and all of these students I guarantee are amazing. So I don't want them to get discouraged if they receive a decision that might not be the one that they want. That is very difficult and I vividly remember going through that myself, but there's always another door. One no means a yes somewhere else. And so not receiving an admit does not mean you did anything wrong. Our pool is just extremely competitive and that goes for every single school nowadays, I feel. So an admissions decision is only an admissions decision. And please remember that you are still an amazing student, no matter what the decisions are. Well, thank you so much for that positive insight. We really appreciate hearing so much more about Vanderbilt University. Can't thank you enough for being with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I hope I was helpful. You certainly were, and it was our pleasure. Thank you again. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend. And follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap.